I'm Jack, the unofficial leader of our small but skilled group. With me were Maria, who could crack any safe or security system, and Simon, a big guy with nerves of steel and hands equally suited for climbing or fighting, should it come to that. We'd scoped out the old Henderson mansion for days, watching for any signs of life or security. Nothing stirred, and no one entered or left. It was a relic waiting to be claimed. It was supposed to be an easy score. The mansion on the edge of town had always been the subject of rumors. Hidden rooms, buried treasure, the whole spiel. When old man Henderson, a millionaire with no heirs or family, supposedly died last month, the place sat silent and seemingly forgotten. That's when we decided it was our turn to explore those rumors. We gathered our gear under the cover of a new moon, cloaked by the night's embrace. Our plan was simple. Get in, find whatever valuables we could, and get out before dawn. We were pros at this kind of work, moving silently and swiftly with precision. Confidence was high, the stakes even higher. As we approached the towering gates of the Henderson estate, the mansion loomed like a specter in the darkness, its grandeur faded by years of neglect but imposing all the same. Looks dead enough, Simon whispered as he cut through the rusted padlock with bolt cutters. We slipped inside, our flashlights cutting narrow swaths through the blackness. The plan was in motion, but even as we moved deeper into the belly of the mansion, a nagging sensation tugged at the back of my mind. It was too quiet, too still. But greed pushed caution aside. After all, we thought the mansion was empty. We couldn't have been more wrong. Once inside the gates, the real work began. The mansion's security system was outdated, almost as ancient as the rumors that shrouded the place. Maria made quick work of the old alarm panel, her fingers dancing over the wires with practiced ease. All clear, she murmured, and a wave of relief washed over me. This was supposed to be easy. We split up to cover more ground. The mansion was a labyrinth of rooms and corridors, each more lavish than the last. The air was heavy with dust and disuse, or so it seemed. As I ventured through what appeared to be the main living room, the beam from my flashlight fell upon a grand piano, its surface gleaming under a thin layer of dust. It felt like walking through a time capsule. Then I noticed something odd, a newspaper, not more than a day old, laid out as if someone had just finished reading it. My pulse quickened. I grabbed my radio. Guys, you might want to see this, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Meeting up in the kitchen, the signs were undeniable. There were fresh vegetables on the counter and a pot on the stove that still held the warmth of a recent meal. Maria looked at me, her eyes wide. Jack, someone's been living here, she whispered, the stark realization setting in. Simon checked the back door. It was bolted tight from the inside. A shiver ran down my spine. This doesn't make sense, I muttered. The place was supposed to be empty. As the reality sank in, our confidence shattered. Every shadow seemed to move. Every silence was heavy with the weight of unseen eyes. We should have left, but the allure of what might be hidden deeper within the mansion urged us on. Ignoring the primal scream of instinct, we pressed deeper into the mansion, unaware of what awaited in the darkness. The deeper we ventured, the heavier the air felt, as if the mansion itself was warning us to turn back. It started with a faint noise, a clatter from below that could have been dismissed as the house settling if not for its rhythmic tapping. Did you hear that? Maria's voice was a mix of curiosity and fear. We stopped, listened, and there it was again, tap, 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 coming from the basement. Simon led the way to the basement door, his confidence bolstering our resolve. Probably just rats, he grunted, though his usual bravado seemed hollow in the echoing halls of the mansion. Despite our mounting apprehension, the lure of hidden treasures pushed us onward. After a brief, tense debate, we agreed to explore the basement. We can handle this, I reassured myself and the others, though my voice faltered. With a deep breath, I swung the door open, and we descended into the bowels of the mansion. The air grew colder as we reached the bottom, our flashlights slicing through the overwhelming darkness. The basement was vast, filled with shadows that danced just beyond the light's reach. Then, without warning, 
Our beams caught the figure of a man. No, more a phantom of a man, rugged and wild, his eyes reflecting the light like an animal caught in headlights. He stood frozen for a split second before letting out a guttural roar that echoed off the stone walls. This was his domain, and we were the intruders. He charged, fueled by a mix of fear and anger. We scattered, dodging behind old furniture and crates, our hearts pounding in our chests. Who are you? I shouted, hoping to reason with him, but the only reply was his continued aggression. It was clear he had lived in isolation for far too long. The lines between man and beast blurred by solitude. As he advanced, it became a primal battle of survival. We had to decide quickly, fight or flee. Panic erupted within me as the resident, a ghostly figure now alive with rage, used his intimate knowledge of his darkened lair to his advantage. We sprinted through the corridors, the sounds of our breaths loud in our ears. But he was faster, more familiar with this maze of shadows than we could ever be. I heard Maria's breath catch as she stumbled, a wrong turn, a moment's hesitation, and she was gone from my sight, lost in the winding passages. From Maria's perspective, the separation was instant and disorienting. Jack? Simon? Her voice echoed off the damp walls, swallowed by the dark. No answer came. Alone, the narrow beam of her flashlight her only guide, she pushed forward. The basement felt alive, each shadow twisting as if watching, each whisper of wind a breath on her neck. The sound of footsteps, sometimes distant, sometimes terrifyingly close, kept her moving, kept her heart racing. The minutes stretched endlessly. When the steps finally moved away, her relief was short-lived. She had to keep moving. With a deep, quiet breath, she edged forward, her hands feeling ahead for obstacles, her mind imagining what lay in wait in the darkness. Above the sound of her own careful movements, the distant sounds of scuffles reached her, Simon and me, still evading our relentless pursuer, we had to regroup, had to find a way out together. But first, she had to find her way back to us, navigating through a labyrinth designed not to welcome, but to ensnare. After what felt like hours of terrifying solitude in the cramped corridors, the beam of my flashlight finally fell on Maria's pale, frightened face. She emerged from a narrow passage. I thought I was done for, she whispered hoarsely, her relief palpable. We quickly shared our experiences, realizing that this house, his domain, had turned into our nightmare. But we couldn't afford to let fear paralyze us any longer. Pooling our collective knowledge of security and the mansion's layout, we crafted a hasty plan. Simon had noticed the resident relied on certain paths, predictable in his ferocity. Using this insight, we decided to set traps along these routes repurposing old wires and heavy furniture to create blockades and tripwires. Our goal was clear. Distract and delay him long enough to secure our escape. With our plan set, tension strung tight among us. We moved with purpose. The traps were crude, but necessary. As we worked, the resident's footsteps echoed through the halls, a constant reminder of the danger we were in. Finally, we lured him into a narrow corridor rigged with a tripwire connected to a heavy bookcase. The moment he tripped, the case toppled, the crash echoing as we bolted towards the exit. With a bit of luck, it would hold him long enough. We ran through the mansion's twisting corridors, the exit finally in sight. As we burst through the front door into the cold night air, freedom never felt so sweet, yet so bitterly won. Our chests heaved with exertion and fear as we put distance between us and the mansion. As we slowed to a stop, gasping for breath under the cover of the trees. The reality of what had happened, and what could still happen, settled in. Should we call the cops? Maria asked, a reasonable part of her still functioning. But how could we explain our presence there without exposing our own crimes? After a tense debate, we decided against it. The risk of self-incrimination too great. We walked away from the Henderson mansion empty-handed, the night's horrors echoing in our minds. We agreed never to speak of it again, the pact sealed by our shared terror. As we disappeared into the night, the mansion loomed in the darkness behind us, 
a silent sentinel of secrets better left undiscovered. My name is Helen, and I never imagined solitude could feel so oppressive, so heavy. Since Robert passed, this sprawling lakeside house, once a haven filled with laughter and whispers of love, has morphed into my prison. Its walls, instead of providing comfort, echo with the loneliness of my new reality. As winter clings to the last bare branches outside, I find myself sifting through Robert's belongings. Each item I touch, a book, a shirt, a hastily scribbled note, seems infused with his presence. My heart aches with the longing for a simpler time when my understanding of him was absolute. Robert was kind, a beacon of integrity and simplicity in my life. Or so I thought. We shared everything. Or at least, I believed we did. But today, driven by a gnawing need for connection, for one last link to the man I loved, I decided to clean out the basement, a space Robert always kept private, promising someday to go through things together. He used to say it was just old junk, remnants of a life before me. Trusting and in love, I never questioned him. Comfortable in our shared life and secure in the belief that some things, even in marriage, could remain unsaid. Little did I know, that decision would soon lead me down a path shaded with doubt and chilled with the whispers of secrets I never saw coming. As I moved boxes and brushed away the cobwebs in the basement, my hand brushed against a panel that seemed oddly loose. Curiosity peaked. I tugged at it, revealing a small, concealed safe nestled behind. My hands shook as I wondered why Robert would need such a hidden refuge in our home. I found the key under an old stack of paint cans, almost as if he'd meant for it to be found one day. Inside the safe were items that didn't belong to the man I thought I knew. A handgun, several passports and IDs with Robert's face but not his name, and a thick stack of cash bundled with rubber bands. It felt like the floor fell away beneath me. This was not the simple, loving man I had married. That evening, still reeling from my discovery, a knock at the door jolted me. A man introduced himself as Mr. Larson, a private investigator. He was polite, yet there was a sharpness in his eyes that made me uneasy. He asked about Robert, his past and his activities with a tone that suggested he knew more than he let on. Mr. Larson hinted that Robert might have been involved in activities far removed from the legal and ordinary, perhaps even dangerous. After he left, a chilling breeze of doubt swept through me. The house felt colder, darker, as if it now harbored the shadows of the secrets I had just uncovered. Questions spiraled in my mind. Had I really known Robert at all? What was he involved in? And crucially, what danger might now be coming my way? drawn by the secrets hidden within these walls. My heart raced as I realized my search for closure had led me to a labyrinth of mystery and menace, one that I would have to navigate carefully. With every fiber of my being screaming for answers, I began to score Robert's belongings more meticulously than before. His old laptop, long forgotten in the back of our closet, became my starting point. Password protected, it took me hours of guessing before I broke in, using the name of our first dog. It opened to reveal a trove of encrypted files that resisted my initial attempts to access them. Desperation led to determination, and after days of effort I managed to decrypt them with software I found online. The files were a Pandora's box. Inside were documents, photos, and correspondences that painted a completely different picture of Robert. He had been deep undercover, exposing corrupt practices within a multinational corporation, a whistleblower of significant importance. More shockingly, he had changed his identity to protect both himself and me from potential backlash. The man I knew as Robert Thompson was a facade. He had erased his past to save our future. But with the truth came danger. It started with phone calls, heavy breaths on the other end and then abrupt hang-ups. I saw cars parked at the end of our driveway, unfamiliar and ominous, disappearing as soon as I approached the window. One evening I caught the glint of binoculars from the car's darkened interior confirming my worst fears. Someone was watching, and the unsettling presence of these watchers made my isolation feel more pronounced than ever. The realization that Robert's past was catching up to me was paralyzing. Our home was now a trap, a place where each creak and whisper of wind might signal an intruder. 
I knew I couldn't live in ignorance or hide from the truth Robert had shielded me from. If I was to defend myself and honor his legacy, I would need to confront whatever came next. Head on. The safety of ignorance had been stripped away, leaving me exposed to a reality where shadows held threats and the man I loved had been a mystery even in his closest moments. I prepared to face whatever consequences his past actions might bring to my doorstep. The night air was thick with tension, a premonition that sleep would elude me. My nerves were frayed, every small sound a potential threat. It was past midnight when the unmistakable sound of glass breaking shattered the silence of my vigil. My heart stopped. This was no longer a distant threat but a real, immediate danger. Clutching the gun I had found, a weighty and foreign object in my life of former peace, I crept from my bedroom. The hallway felt endless as I moved towards the noise. From the shadows I watched, heart pounding, as two figures rifled through Robert's study, tossing papers, searching. Their hushed voices were spiked with urgency. We have to find it before she realizes what it is, one muttered to the other, unaware of my presence. Using my intimate knowledge of the house, I slipped into the adjoining room, where Robert's old camera was set up, still connected to a recording system we had once used for home security. My hands, though shaking, managed to position it to capture the intruders' faces. I hit record. Circling back, I confronted them, my voice steadier than I felt. Looking for something? I demanded, aiming the gun at them with trembling hands. The surprise on their faces gave me a momentary upper hand. Listen, lady, we don't want to hurt you, the taller one began, his companion nodding agreement. We just need the files your husband kept. Their admission struck a nerve, igniting a fierce determination within me. You mean the files he used to expose your corruption? I countered, my voice rising. The camera behind me captured every word, their faces clear in its frame. The standoff stretched on, every second a tightrope of tension. Then, exploiting a moment of their hesitation, I threatened to call the police, my phone speaker loud enough for them to hear the dial tone. Panicked, they fled leaving behind a mess and the echoes of their confessions. After locking the doors and checking every possible entry point twice, I collapsed against the wall, the camera still recording. The evidence was damning, a direct confession caught on tape. This footage was my leverage, my protection. It was proof of their break-in and their intent, a powerful tool against the organization that now sought to silence me. As dawn broke, casting light on the disarray left by the intruders, I realized that my fight was just beginning, but with the evidence I had secured, I was no longer defenseless. I had something they feared, the truth. I called the police and explained the situation, but I knew that simply waiting for them wouldn't guarantee my safety. Grabbing a few essentials, I slipped out the back door and made my way through the dense woods to my neighbor's house, where I knew I could find refuge until help arrived. The police were quick to respond. By the time they arrived at my house, the intruders had returned, foolishly trying to retrieve what they'd left behind. The officers apprehended them without incident, and an investigation into their criminal organization commenced immediately. My recorded evidence was crucial, revealing not only the immediate threat, but also deeper layers of corruption that Robert had tried to expose. Feeling the weight of the past start to lift, I made the decision to leave the lakeside house behind. It was time for a new beginning, somewhere fresh somewhere free from the shadows of Robert's secret life. Selling the house felt like shedding an old skin, a final step in honoring Robert's memory by continuing his fight for justice. This experience left a lingering shadow, a reminder that sometimes the ordinary is anything but, and the secrets we uncover can change us forever. For those who remain vigilant, the truth is a powerful ally, and survival a testament to the strength of the human spirit. My name is Leah, and I've found what many dream of but few achieve. A slice of paradise where the world's incessant noise fades into the tranquil whispers of nature. Here, in my secluded cabin nestled deep in the woods, I live enveloped by serene beauty. The trees are my neighbors, and the wind through their leaves is my conversation. Being deaf, I don't hear the sounds, but I feel them.
a rhythmic pulse that syncs perfectly with the quiet world I cherish. As a photographer, this isolation allows me to capture landscapes untouched by the hustle of city life. My camera is my voice, my way of showing the world the beauty I see through my lens. Each picture is a sign, a gesture made in the universal language of imagery, revealing the vibrant life that silence can hold. I communicate fluently in American Sign Language, but here, surrounded by the stillness of nature, my photographs do the talking. I've always believed that this cabin, this sacred space I've made my own, was my fortress of solitude, a haven not just for my art, but for my soul. Here, I thought I was safe from the world's chaos, sheltered from its storms. Little did I know, as I focused my lens and captured the light, that the true test of my peace was just on the horizon, creeping closer with each shutter click. While sorting through the digital captures of my latest expedition into the woods, my eyes paused on an anomaly, a photograph that didn't belong among the serene landscapes. There, in the background, barely discernible among the foliage, was the unsettling image of a figure, half hidden, appearing to drag something heavy, something that terrifyingly resembled a human form. My hands trembled as I zoomed in, the reality sinking in that I might have unwittingly captured a crime. Terrified, I transferred the image onto a secure drive. That image shattered my illusion of isolation and safety. The danger, it seemed, had found its way into my refuge. Over the next few days, a creeping sense of unease took hold. Small, seemingly inconsequential things began to feel ominous. I noticed tools from my shed slightly moved. Not enough to alarm anyone else, perhaps, but enough to prick my heightened senses. There were also faint footprints near the cabin, too large to belong to any forest creature, and certainly not from my own walks. Each subtle sign compounded my anxiety, building a tapestry of fear. I had lived here in peace, believing that distance from the city meant distance from its perils. Now, each shadow at the edge of my vision seemed to twitch with potential threat. I realized that whoever I had captured in that photograph might now be aware of me. The thought that I was possibly being watched, stalked even, by someone who had something sinister to hide, turned every whisper of the wind into a possible harbinger of danger. One chilly evening, as twilight draped its cool shadows over the cabin, I felt an unmistakable prick of alarm. Through the corner of a window, a shadow flickered. Someone was out there, observing. My heart raced as I caught a brief glimpse of a figure lurking just beyond the glass, their features obscured by the failing light. With no time to lose, I sprang into action, securing every window and door. The cabin suddenly felt like a fortress under siege. As I moved through my home, the reality of my situation took hold. I was alone profoundly alone in a way that my deafness usually made me appreciate in silence. But now, silence felt like a threat. Whoever had been caught in my photograph knew I had seen too much, and they might be desperate enough to ensure I kept silent. Determined not to be caught off guard, I tapped into my well-honed instincts as a photographer. I rigged my most powerful camera flashes to function as makeshift security measures. Positioned strategically by the main entry points, these flashes were set to ignite a blinding burst of light when triggered by motion. It was a simple but effective setup meant to disorient any intruder long enough for me to either hide or escape. I also prepared a safe room, a small pantry with a reinforced door and a secondary exit that led out through a hidden path in the forest. Inside, I placed essentials, water, a flashlight, and my cell phone, equipped with emergency numbers preloaded and within easy reach. My phone, often useless for calls given my inability to hear, had a video call feature that could prove vital if I needed to visually communicate with police. As night deepened, I reviewed my preparations, each step making me feel a fraction more empowered. Despite the fear that thrummed through my veins, there was also a surge of resolve. I had transformed my vulnerabilities into strengths, and as I settled into watch, the soft glow of my camera's standby lights offered a silent promise of protection. The darkness was thick, pressing against the windows like a tangible force as I sat, breath held, eyes fixed on the monitors displaying feeds from the cameras I had set up around the perimeter of the cabin. It was past midnight when the alarm flashed on my tablet, 
signaling a breach at the back window. My heart leapt. This was it. The moment I had dreaded yet prepared for. With cautious, silent steps, I approached the location, keeping to the shadows. The intruder had managed to quietly force open the window and was now creeping through my home. The soft red glow from my camera lights blinked, a warning that someone was moving through my designated no-go zones. As he edged closer to my studio, where I had staged the incriminating photograph in plain view as bait, I readied myself behind the partial concealment of a door. The first camera flash detonated with a brilliant flare, catching him off guard. Startled, he staggered back, shielding his eyes. I triggered the second and third flashes remotely, further disorienting him as he floundered to regain his bearings amidst the blinding light. Seizing the moment, I stepped into view, keeping a safe distance. I held up a note I had prepared, which read, I know what you're after. The police already have copies. His momentary confusion was replaced by a flicker of panic as he read my message, his eyes darting around, calculating his next move. But I had planned one step ahead. I backed into the dark room specifically rigged for this confrontation, the final trap. As he followed, determined to grab the photograph, I activated the most powerful flash unit, coupled with a camera that was live streaming directly to the local sheriff's station. The flash filled the room with an intense light, blinding him momentarily. On the stream, his bewildered, exposed face was being recorded, capturing the evidence needed to identify him. Taking advantage of his disorientation, I slipped out through the hidden door in the floor of the pantry, emerging outside into the cold night air. I ran with all the speed I could muster, through the woods by a path only I knew, emerging minutes later at my neighbor's house. With trembling hands, I motioned urgently for help, and my neighbor, understanding the gravity of the situation, quickly called the police for me, providing the exact location and ensuring they were aware of the live feed evidence still capturing everything. As I waited for the police, wrapped in a blanket my neighbor had provided, the adrenaline slowly ebbed away, replaced by a deep, weary relief. When the officers arrived, I led them through the woods back to my cabin. They found the intruder still disoriented and quickly apprehended him. The video footage and the photograph I had taken were pivotal. Not only did they confirm his identity, but they also connected him to a broader investigation into a missing persons case that had baffled local authorities for months. My faith in my solitude was shaken but not shattered. Instead, it evolved into a stronger, more informed trust in my ability to live safely on my terms.